Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, in this world, there are two kinds of people. People who like riddles and people who don't. I hope we've got some people who do this morning because I've got a couple riddles for you. So, I want you to answer out loud once you've got the answer, uh, and we'll see who uh, is wise among us today. So here's our first one. Here we go. First, think of the color of the clouds. Next, think of the color of snow. Now think of the color of a bright full moon. Now quickly answer out loud. What do cows drink? Milk? No, 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 no. Cows don't drink milk. They give us milk. Cows drink water, guys. I heard a few of you got it. Okay. All right. Okay, let's try another one. What has a bottom at its top? Anybody? Your legs. <laughs> what has a bottom? Sorry. Sorry. I apologize. I was feeling a little cheeky this morning. So... Decided to throw that one in there. All right, this last one, this is actually from God's Word. This is from the book of Judges that we're going to be looking at today. So if you know the answer to this one, uh, don't say it. We'll come back to it. But listen to this. This is an actual riddle written by Samson. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. Don't answer it out loud. Think about it. I'm going to let it marinate for a minute and let you try to figure out what that answer is if you're not familiar with that. And if you know the story of Samson, some of you go, oh, I know that. I can't wait to shout it out later. Before we dive into the rest of Judges, I want to give a quick flyby. We have, we have been traveling through the Old Testament this summer. It has been incredible to look at men and women of God who have been faithful to God's plan, but ultimately men and women of God fail, and it's all about Yahweh, God Almighty, who restores, redeems, and makes all things new. He started with creation, he started with Adam and Eve, and from there we see things quickly deteriorated with their own son murdering one of their other sons. We got to the point where God couldn't take it anymore, and he sent a flood to destroy everybody except for Noah, his wife, his sons, and their wives. Eight people got to survive on the earth. We move on from there, and we see these heroes of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, and the people of God start to flourish. The Hebrew people begin to populate, and they basically are getting to the point where they're going to take over Egypt, and Pharaoh says, that's enough. We're making these people our slaves. And millions of God's people were under the control of the Pharaoh for over 400 years until God rose up another man named Moses, along with his brother Aaron, who would go before Pharaoh in the spirit and might of the Lord and say, let my people go. And miraculously, through the mighty hand of God, through the plagues that he put on the people of Egypt, finally Pharaoh said, enough, get out of here, be gone. But he changed his mind and he chased them to the edge of the Red Sea. God parted that sea. And the people of God walked through on dry land and he closed the waters over Pharaoh and his chariots and destroyed his entire army in that moment. Then, then God said, okay, I'm going to lead you now to your promised land. Follow the pillar of cloud. Follow the pillar of fire. Listen to what I say. And Moses went up on the mountain and received the law, received the instructions for building the tabernacle, the place where the Lord would dwell, received the instructions for the system of sacrifices, and the people blew it. They didn't even wait for Moses to come down the mountain before they created a golden calf to worship instead of Yahweh, God Almighty. And we don't have time over this summer season to get into the next few books of the Bible, but I encourage you to do so. We're going to actually just right now do Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy in about 10 seconds. Leviticus, a whole lot of rules about how God is holy and how we need to treat God. It's very important. God expects perfection. He demands it, and he has every right because guess what? He's God, and we're not. Numbers. The people screwed up so badly that God said, okay, you're going to walk in circles for 40 years. <laughs> I've got this promised land ready, a land flowing with milk and honey. It is ready. It is ripe for the taking, but no, sorry, you guys are going to wander because of your sin. And this generation is going to die off and not get to go in. Moses, you actually messed up. 
I told you to speak to a rock to get the water to come out the second time, and you struck the rock. And so Moses, you're going to climb this mountain, and you're going to see the promised land before you die, but you're not going in. And so a whole generation passes, and God raises up another man named Joshua. And Joshua leads the people into the promised land. How does he do so? God splits the Jordan River in two, and the people walk across on dry land. Well, what does that sound like? Sounds like what had happened just a few generations earlier. And then God gives the Israelite people victory after victory as they trust in him. The walls of Jericho. Your kids know that story. You better know that story. They marched around and the walls came tumbling down and the people of God took Jericho. They took city after city and God said, here it is. Here is your promised land. You've got the law. You've got the tabernacle. Now you've got your inheritance and that leads us now to the book of Judges. Sounds amazing. Sounds like we're in a great place. Sounds like everything should be going exactly the way God planned. They've got their land. They've got their laws. They've got a lot of people. They've got flocks and herds and plenty. And so let's see what happens. We're going to pick up at Judges chapter 2, starting in verse 6. It says, After Joshua had dismissed the Israelites, they went to take possession of the land, each to their own inheritance. The people served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and the elders who outlived him and who had seen all the great things that the Lord had done for Israel. Awesome. There we go. Here's your land. Here's your promise. Follow me and you will continue in this forever. This is the end of the Western movie. This is Joshua riding into the sunset saying, we did it. Mission accomplished. But then Joshua dies. And we have to see how the story goes. Joshua, in verse 8, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110, and they buried him in the land of his inheritance. So now the leader of the God's people has passed away. What's going to happen? Judges 2, verse 10. After that whole generation had been gathered to their ancestors, in other words, after all of Joshua's generation had died, another generation grew up who knew neither the Lord nor what he had done for Israel. One generation, and the people of God forgot about God. One generation. Kids growing up with a grandpa that marched around Jericho, and now they've forgotten the God that gave them this land. Here they are on this beautiful farmland with their sheep and their herds and everything they could want, and they don't remember that it's from Yahweh. And it reminds us We're only one generation away today from the people of God forgetting about him. And so when Chris gets up here and he says, think about serving at VBS starting next week, the 13th through the 17th, truly think about it. Think about serving on Sundays with those kids. They want to see your face week after week. They want to get to know you. You've got something that they need. You've got knowledge of the living God. If you've got Wednesday nights available, jump in with our middle schoolers and our high schoolers. We are one generation away from it being gone. That's how important the message of God is for the next generation. It's not for us just to sit in here today and go, that's great. We've got the gospel. We're all set. Let's go home. Let's have our lunch and let's move on. No, we need the people of God to be people who make sure the next generation are people of God. We're the plan. We are God's plan for the redemption of the next generation. And so I encourage you to think about that and think and pray hard about how you can step up for the next generation. But let's go back to the people of God. Judges 2, 11 through 19 gives us this perfect summary of the entire book, basically. It tells us, okay, so now this generation has forgotten about Yahweh and his decrees. They didn't forget he existed. They just forgot that he's supposed to be the only one in their life. And so let's just see what God's word has to say as they decline quite rapidly. It says, Then the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord and served the Baals. They forsook or abandoned the Lord, the God of their ancestors, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed and worshipped various gods of the peoples around them. They aroused the Lord's anger because they forsook him and served Baal and the Asherahs. These are Canaanite gods, false gods from the people that lived in the land that God had given them. In his anger against Israel, the Lord gave them into the hands of raiders who plundered them. He sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, whom they were no longer able to resist. Whenever Israel went out to fight, the hand of the Lord was against them. 
to defeat them just as he had sworn to them. And they were in great distress. Not a great place to be. Not what the people of God are called to be. Not what God had set up through Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, all of these amazing leaders. It's already fading away. But yet there's still a remnant. And yet God is still faithful because he still chooses his people to be his people. Verse 16 says, Then the Lord raised up judges who saved them out of the hands of these raiders. Yet they would not listen to their judges, but prostituted themselves to other gods and worshipped them. They quickly turned from the ways of their ancestors who had been obedient to the Lord's commands. Whenever the Lord raised up a judge for them, he was with the judge, and he saved them out of the hands of their enemies as long as the judge lived. For the Lord relented because of their groaning under those who oppressed and afflicted them. But when the judge died, the people returned to ways even more corrupt than those of their ancestors, following other gods, serving and worshiping them. They refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. And this is the book of Judges. And story after story will happen, and we will see the Israelite people enter into what I call just a death spiral. Check out this image on the screen. This is the book of Judges essentially time after time, judge after judge. The people of God sin. You never want to start a chart with sin at the top. That's never a good thing. (laughs) They sin. So God says, okay, you want to worship their gods? The gods you're worshiping, those people are going to actually take over now. You want to worship their gods? They now own you. They now rule over you. So oppression sets in. The people of God have lost the power of the Spirit. And eventually it becomes so bad that they repent. Oh, we are so sorry, God. We, I'm sorry we forgot about you. Please save us from the hand of the Philistines, the Moabites, you name it. Save us from these peoples. And God listens. And God relents. And he sends them a judge, a deliverer, a military leader, a man or woman of God to bring them to a period of deliverance. And typically in these stories, we see some incredible, powerful moments as God vanquishes the enemy of the Israelites. And then the judge's life plays out during a period of peace, sometimes several decades, sometimes just a few years, but there's a period of peace, and then guess what? It starts all over again. And it happens time after time after time. But the thing is, when they get to the sin cycle the second time, it's even worse than the first. The third time, it's even worse than the second. And it gets worse and worse and worse. And they are caught in this continuous death spiral all because of sin. And if we look around the world today, and if we think about our own sinful nature, our own hearts, we can see that there's a sinful death spiral that's trying to take over our very lives. We don't have to look very far. It's easy to go, oh yeah, the world, so broken, so messed up. We can look at ourselves and see it happening. We're addicted to those sins. We love those sins. I don't have to look very far to see sin in my household. I've got three little boys. (laughs) I've got a five-year-old named Micah, and I think he gave me permission to tell this story, but we'll see uh, if he's watching right now. Love you, Micah. You're a good boy. Don't be mean to mommy right now. We got uh, a big delivery uh, the other day. Have you ever gotten one of those delivery boxes where the item is like 10% the size of the box? Like they, they ran out of boxes one, two, and three, so they sent you box 12. And so it was this giant box for a tiny little item. And so a boy's favorite thing, an empty box. Don't throw that away. That is a treasure. And you're thinking, yeah, he's probably going to build a fort or you know, cut it up and make a robot. No, Micah asked if he could take his Lego spear and stab holes in the box. Daddy, can I please stab the box? Yes, son, you may. Go to town. And so he went nuts, and he had a big old space in that box that just had been destroyed, tons and tons of holes in it. And I thought, you know, it's fine. Getting some aggression out, no big deal. Uh, All of that work apparently made him thirsty. He asked for a cup of juice. We obliged. And as I handed him the cup of juice, I said, just one thing, buddy. If you're going to set down your cup and stab the box some more, please don't set the cup on the box turn away for a millisecond, turn back, the cup is on the box, and he's raising his hand with that tiny little Lego spear ready to go to town and spill juice everywhere. Fortunately, I caught him. (laughs) I stopped him. But my goodness, five seconds after giving him a rule, he did the exact opposite of what I said. And he's a picture of us 
He's a picture of this world, and he's a picture of the people of God. We don't want to honor him. There's something inside us, this sin nature that pulls us away from the will of God for our lives. But the reality is, is that it looks a lot different in today's world. I don't think many of you have tiny little statues made of wood or metal or stone on a shelf or on the mantle that you're bowing down to as you also worship God with part of your life. I don't think if I go over to your house, you're going to have an Asherah pole up in the backyard. That's probably not the issue today. The issue today isn't Baals and Asherahs. The issue today is that we are worshiping other things, pride and self-pity. We love to worship ourselves. We want to be number one. And we get in the way of worshiping God. Sexual sin, it's rampant. And it always has been. Paul talks about it a lot because he knows that we become people who worship images on a screen. Or we worship another person who is not our spouse for sexual pleasure. There's the idol of today. Drugs and alcohol. We worship that feeling We're chasing something that a substance gives us that's fleeting and leaves us just wanting more, leaves us more empty than we were before. What about people-pleasing? What about trying to do everything right for the sake of others to be liked? Again, that's tied to pride, but that's worshiping that feeling of being accepted by others. Whatever it is, we still struggle with idols today. And so we see it in the Israelites, we see it in us. And we see now that the Israelites are just going to spiral downward, 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 and it's going to get dark. It's going to get ugly. And if you're going to read Judges 17 and 18, I suggest that you don't have your kids around when you do it. It gets that bad. Let's take a look at the final verse from the book of Judges and see how bad things had gotten. In those days, there was no king over Israel, and everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That is a garlic butter cup from Papa John's in a Keurig machine. I love some good garlic sauce on the crust of my Papa John's pizza. I don't want to drink it out of a coffee cup. But this is what God sees. When we spiral into these sins of today, when the people of God were chasing after little statues and poles that they had put up, this is what he sees. It's ludicrous. It's ridiculous. And we laugh at it. But this is what's happening. We have a whole month that we are in right now dedicated to pride. The very first sin. That's the world we're living in. That's what's going on in our world right now. We're putting garlic cups in our coffee makers and calling it a delicious drink. That's how crazy sin makes us. In those days, there was no king, and everyone did evil. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. We need help. Israel needed help. And God heard that, and he relented of his anger, and he sent them judges. When you think about judges, it's important. Don't think about someone in a black robe sitting in a courtroom overseeing judicial cases. That's not what this type of judge is. A better word would be deliverer. The judges in the book of Judges were saviors of the people. They delivered them out of the hands of their enemies. They were men and women of God who were given the spirit of the Lord to do incredible feats in order to save the people of God from the oppression that they had brought on themselves. And so for the sake of time today, we can't go through the entire book of Judges. There's some incredible ones in there. I encourage you to read it. Read about Ehud, the left-handed judge. Read about Deborah, who led an incredible battle. Read about about Gideon, who doubted himself so much that he had to ask God, prove that you're really there, but then destroyed an army of 100,000 with 300 men. But we're not going to talk about them today. We're going to talk about probably the most famous judge, the hero, Samson. We're going to look at his life, and we're going to look at his death, And we're going to see how God's delivery plan can work, how it should work, how we get in the way of it, but how God still delivers. So let me take you through the life of Samson. The beautiful thing about Samson's life is the way it started. 
It says in Judges 13 that the angel of the Lord came to Samson's mother. They don't even name her in the Bible. She is just known as the mother of Samson, the wife of Manoah. And the angel came and said, you who are barren, you who are unable to conceive, will have a son. An angel coming and telling a woman she would have a baby. That sounds pretty good, right? That sounds like another story we know. That sounds like our great deliverer, Jesus Christ. So the story starts out incredibly well. And the angel tells the parents, your son will be a Nazarite. And now a Nazarite was someone who usually voluntarily took a vow to the Lord. It was for a period of time, and they agreed to several things in order to be set apart as a holy person. Number one, no alcohol could touch their lips. They couldn't even eat grapes or raisins. That's how serious this vow was. Number two, you cannot touch any dead body. Even if your own mother or father drops dead, it says you cannot make the burial preparations. You have to have other people come in and do it. No touching of anything that would make you unclean. And number three, no razor shall touch your head. No haircuts during the vow. Samson wasn't given a timeline. The angel of the Lord said he will be a Nazarite from birth and will be one his entire life. Samson was called to be set apart as God's deliverer for his entire life. And that's where we jump in. And that's where we see what God intended for good sometimes gets thwarted by our own sinful desires. So back to that riddle from the book of Judges that I told you about at the beginning. Here it is again. Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. This riddle came about because one day Samson decided, I like the looks of that Philistine woman over there. The Philistines were the people that were currently oppressing the people of God. They were the enemy of God. And Samson's parents said, please marry an Israelite. Please marry someone from within our clan. He said, no, I like the looks of her. I'm going to chase after her. Just like the people of Israel were chasing after these false gods and this false culture. And so as he went along with his parents to meet this woman, it says they were attacked by a lion. And Samson ripped the lion apart, and the scripture says, just as someone would rip apart a young goat, which apparently was something they did because that's the language (laughs) that the author used. So he ripped the lion apart and left it on the side of the road dead. We pick up in Judges 14, verses 8 and 9. It says, sometime later, Samson turned aside to look at the lion's carcass. Oh, there it is. There's that lion I killed. And in it, he saw a swarm of bees with some honey. He scooped out the honey with his hands, and he ate it as he went along. He rejoined his parents and gave them some, and they too ate it. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey from the lion's carcass. So he kills this lion, he rips it apart, he throws the dead body to the side of the road, he comes back a little later and he reaches into this dead body and receives something sweet, something nourishing, something that he wants to get life from. He then goes on to turn it into his riddle. And he attempts to trick 30 men, 30 Philistines, into buying him 30 suits of clothing if they can't solve the riddle. Well, they threaten his Philistine wife, and she then nags Samson to death, and he finally gives her the answer, and they finally get the answer from her and trick Samson into owing them 30 suits of clothing. So what's the answer? Out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. They say, well, what's sweeter than honey, and what's stronger than a lion? There's the answer to your biblical riddle from the book of Judges. But what's more important than that was the fact that Samson was looking for life in a dead thing. And we'll see this throughout his four chapters of the book of Judges. Samson looks for life in dead things. He's chasing after a Philistine woman to be his wife. He's going into a dead body to pull honey out. And he'll do so many more things that just results in his eventual death. So that begs the question, well, when did Samson actually break his Nazarite vow? Well, most of us think it was when he got that unholy haircut, right? That's when the vow was broken. That's when he stopped being a Nazarite, holy to the Lord. Well, no, he just reached into a dead carcass. He broke the vow. At his bachelor party, 
to marry this foreign Philistine woman. The Hebrew word used for feast implies a lot of heavy drinking of alcoholic beverages. Strike two, Samson, you're not supposed to let any alcohol touch your lips. You're breaking your vow to be set apart for God and for his work. Later on, one of the most famous stories of Samson, he would pick up a donkey's jawbone and kill 1,000 Philistines. Wow! Incredible! But one problem. You just picked up a piece of a dead body again, Samson. You're looking for life in dead things. And so Samson represents all of Israel. And Samson and Israel were looking for life in dead things. So the question for us today, where are you looking for life right now? Where are you looking for life right now? Are you trapped in that death spiral of sin, hoping that it's just going to someday satisfy? Or are you looking to the true deliverer who can provide life? Samson's story continues. He actually loses his first Philistine wife. The Philistines actually kill her, and Samson is filled with rage and starts taking revenge on the Philistines, leading to the thousand of them that he killed with the jawbone. And then enter Delilah, another Philistine woman that catches Samson's eye, and his lust for women outside of God's people is too much, and he goes for her again, and he enters into a relationship with another woman who's only going to bring death. And most of you know the story now. We pick up with Samson and Delilah, probably the most famous part of Samson's story. The Philistines come to Delilah and say, we're going to load you up with tons of silver. You want to get rich quick scheme? Give away Samson's secret of his strength, and you will be rich, Delilah. And she agrees. There's nothing in the scripture to indicate that she loved him. Samson loved her. He was infatuated with her. He was lusting after her. She was lusting after the silver. So Samson, hey baby, tell me the the secret of your strength. I just want to know. I'm your wife. I should know these things. And Samson says, well, if you tie me up with fresh bowstrings, I will lose my strength. Okay, take a nap, sweetie. She ties him up with fresh bowstrings, invites some Philistines into the house and says, wake up, the Philistines are here. He snaps them like thread and he takes care of business. Oh, honey, how can you not trust me? Why aren't you going to tell me your secret? Okay, sorry, yeah, it wasn't bowstrings. Actually, it's fresh, brand new ropes. If you tie me up with brand new ropes, I will lose my strength. Again, she goes through the process. Hey, go to sleep, sweetie. Ties him up with fresh ropes, brings in some guys. They're here, they're upon you. Boom, same result. She's starting to get a little annoyed. I don't know what he's doing, but she starts to get annoyed, which is interesting because she's trying to undermine him. Okay, I really need you to trust me and tell me your secret. Even though the last two times you told me, I tried to undo your strength. Okay, well, if you tie the seven braids of my hair into the loom, I will lose my strength. Uh Uh-oh, now he's talking about his hair. Now he's getting a little closer to the truth. So again, he goes to sleep, and somehow she weaves the braids of his hair into the loom. I don't know how you sleep through that, but he did. And again, hey, guys, come on in. I think we figured it out this time. Samson, they're here. Boom, rips the pin out of the loom, takes care of business. And then it says that she just nagged him day and night, day and night, day and night, until he finally was worn down and said, fine, I'll tell you my secret. No razor has ever touched my head. If my head gets shaved, I will lose my strength. And the scriptures say, he then took a nap on her lap, fell asleep on her lap. And guess what she did? She brought in the Philistine barber and said, cut this guy's hair. And when he woke up this time, the Spirit of the Lord had left him because that was the source of his strength. And the Philistines captured him. It says they gouged out his eyes and they took him back to their capital as a prisoner. Samson was so infatuated with his own life, with the seeking of living things out of death that he was willing to give everything away. He was looking for life in dead things. And it eventually will lead to his death. So the Philistines have captured him. He's blind. He doesn't know what's going on. But there's a a remnant. There's always hope for the people of God. Judges 16.22 says this, The hair on Samson's head began to grow again. While he was in prison, his hair started to grow back. 
and then listen to this. This is the end of Samson's life. He's in at a big old party in the middle of the Philistine temple. He's up against the pillars, and he is just being mocked and ridiculed and laughed at for their entertainment, and he prays this prayer. Judges 16, 28 and following. Sovereign Lord. The word there is Yahweh. He is calling out to the true God now at this point. Yahweh, remember me. Let me stop right there. Yahweh never forgot, Samson. Yahweh never forgot about you and me. We forget about him, just like the people of Israel had done. But he prays, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Then Samson put his hands on the two central pillars on which the temple stood and bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other, Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it, over 3,000 people. Thus he killed more when he died than when he lived. That was Samson's final act in the spirit of God, his death. And he took a lot of Philistines with him. Scripture tells us that he led Israel for 20 years. For 20 years he led Israel but he couldn't deliver Israel because the cycle continued and they were so far into the darkness. And just like Samson, the people of Israel were looking for life in dead thing after dead thing after dead thing. And when we do that, we get caught in that same death spiral. But the encouragement today is that we would look to the living God for living things. Stop looking for life in dead things and look to the living God for living things. The people of Israel forgot. Let's not forget. The people of Israel forgot the song of Moses. Moses wrote a beautiful song at the end of his life to remind the people of Israel what Yahweh had done for them. And he says this in Deuteronomy 32, verse 13. Is that a... We good? Fire alarm or phone? I think it's just a phone. Okay. All right. Spirit of God's still in this place. We're good. Wow. Okay. Quite the ringtone. Okay. Where were we? Well, we forgot about God. Let's go back to him. Okay. Moses wrote this beautiful song to remind the people, here's everything God has done for us. Here's everything that has happened. Here's the land that you're about to receive. And in Deuteronomy 32, 13, Moses says this in his beautiful song. It says, he made him ride on the heights of the land. He fed him with the fruit of the fields. He nourished him with honey from the rock and with oil from the flinty crag. He's talking about the fact that the people of Israel would enter into the promised land, also known as a land flowing with milk and honey. And isn't it unique here that Moses says they would find honey not from a dead lion, not from a dead thing, not from a carcass, but Yahweh would provide them honey from the rock. We look to life from the living God, and he provides There's one other place where honey from the rock is mentioned, and it was actually written hundreds of years after the book of Judges. One of the writers of Psalms, I think, sums up the entire story of Judges so beautifully and so perfectly, and it's in Psalm chapter 81. It says this, I am the Lord your God, who brought you up out of Egypt. Open wide your mouth and fill it. But my people would not listen to me. Israel would not submit to me. So I gave them over to their stubborn hearts to follow their own devices. If my people would only listen to me, if Israel would only follow my ways, how quickly I would subdue their enemies and turn my hand against their foes. Those who hate the Lord would cringe before him and their punishment would last forever. But you would be fed with the finest of wheat. With honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. I'll be honest, up until about a week ago, I had never 
heard this phrase. I'm sure I maybe have read this psalm, and I know I've read Deuteronomy in the past, but I've never thought about this beautiful phrase, honey from the rock. What God is saying here is that he has a life of abundance for us. The psalmist says says it, just listen to what God has to say. Follow him closely and he will provide you with what you need. For the people of Israel, it was physical land, it was inheritance, it was flocks and herds, and it was literal honey coming from the rock. For us, it's something so much more. Because you see, the book of Judges doesn't end in darkness. The book of Judges doesn't end when that actual book of the Bible closes out. The story of Judges, or the story of God's deliverers, which is a better word than Judges, actually ends over a thousand years later with the birth, the life, the death, and the resurrection of our perfect deliverer, our perfect judge, Jesus Christ. He became human. He took on human flesh. He stayed God but became human in the mystery of what we call the incarnation. He lived a perfect life. He followed what the psalm said. If you would just listen to Yahweh, Jesus always did. He always submitted to the will of the Father, never once committed a sin. But yet he died, not because he deserved a punishment, not his consequence, but our consequence. He died the death that you and I deserve. We've all been stuck in that downward spiral of sin. We've all been desperate for a deliverer. We have all been oppressed by the enemy. And God said, no human can do it. I need my son to take on human flesh. He's the only one who can do it. So he sent his son Jesus to die in our place. But Jesus wasn't like that lion lying on the side of the road. He didn't stay dead. Jesus rose again three days later. He is clean. He is resurrected. He is perfect. And he offers us now honey from the rock. Jesus Christ is the honey. There's nothing sweeter than knowing him. Jesus Christ is the rock. He is our foundation. He is our safe place. He is our protection. Church, I want to ask you to stand this morning. We have the opportunity right now to receive that honey from the rock. We have a brand new song that we're going to sing this morning before we go today about the fact that Jesus is our honey. Jesus is our rock and that we can find life in living things. Please sing with us now. There is nothing sweeter. There is nothing greater. There is nothing better than knowing Jesus Christ as your Lord, as your Savior, as your friend. If you know that, I pray that today strengthens you in that as you find more and more honey from the rock as you go from here today. If you don't know Jesus yet, I pray that you invite him in right now. I pray that the spirit of the living God, the spirit that gave Samson the power to overcome a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone would come into your heart right now. That the spirit of the living God who put flesh on Jesus Christ and made him man and gave him to us would empower you right now to say, yes, I believe because there is nothing sweeter in this life or the next. I'll leave you with this thought today. In the Bible, when we see honey, when you see it, it represents abundant life. Jesus says the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. You know who came to change that? Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it abundantly. Church, it is our prayer that you would have an abundant life in Jesus Christ. And now may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Go in his peace. Amen.